This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Once again. Enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Oh, I will call upon the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. I will call upon the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Oh, I will call upon the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. I will call upon the Lord. salvation be exalted the lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the god of my salvation be exalted sing it again oh i will call upon the lord for he is worthy to be praised i will call upon the Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
have a sense that there's probably different needs represented in the room here, people who are sick or maybe have friends who are sick or hurting in any way and you need the Lord to touch you. Uh, we open up a few moments, uh, as many services as we can, to allow you to slip out of your seats and come forward. And uh, we have people who have been trained to pray, who will be up here, will pray with you. And whatever your need, again, it doesn't have to be for you. Maybe it's for someone else. But make sure you slip out from where you are. Come on up. Someone will pray for you. Or if you can't, come to the front. Just lift your hand right where you are, and someone will come to you and to pray with you. I just want to spend these few moments allowing the Lord to minister to us. The rest of us just continue to pray. Pray for those who have come forward and uh, just look to the Lord and meditate on Him.
stand with me and let's sing it together. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great. Ushers are going to come forward and we're going to receive Holy Communion. Let's pray. Father, prepare our hearts as we do what your son called us to do, to eat and drink in remembrance of him. So speak to us today. Help us to receive the bread of life, the wine of heaven, as we eat and drink these that represent that. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated as our ushers come forward. I want to let you know that if you're visiting with us, if it's your first time, we practice open communion. That means if you know Jesus as your Savior, then you are welcome to eat and drink with us. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, this is the perfect time for you to reach out to him and ask him to save you. If you've never said, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent of my entire life of, of uh, walking away from you. Forgive me cleanse me, wash me. If you do that, the Bible says that you'll be saved. The Bible says all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So call on him right where you are. So when the communion elements come to you, you'll be prepared. You'll be ready to eat and drink. If you're, if you're not a Christian and you do not desire uh, Jesus, then you wouldn't want this communion either because this is communion with him. So you would want to receive Christ as your Savior. We do ask also that you would Wait until everyone has been served, and then we'll eat and drink together. So our ushers will serve you now. Thank you, ushers, because you and others who are also serve, you serve us faithfully every Sunday. We appreciate you. Thank you for doing that. It's an important and amazing, important role. So thank you for what you do. Would you lift up the elements with me? Our Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, 
he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Our Lord Jesus, we remember you as we eat this that represents your broken body. Let's eat together. the same manner when supper had ended he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to his disciples saying drink this all of you this is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you do this in remembrance of me precious Lord Jesus we thank you for your blood that was shed on our behalf for our sins and for our sake and we remember it today as we drink together let's drink together We say thank you to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Where would we be if it had not been for you? Where would we be today if it had not been for your intervention in our lives? Every one of us would have been lost and on a road to destruction, but you found us in the midst of our sin and you rescued us you reached down for us so we will always praise you jesus we will always magnify you and thank you no wonder it's written of you worthy is the lamb because you're worthy of thanks anyone who would do what you have done and what you continue to do for us is worthy of a lifetime an eternity of worship and that's what we intend to do so we remember what you have done today. We honor you. We thank you. And we ask that, bread of heaven, you would feed us till we want nothing of this world. Wine of God, just saturate us so that we can be filled to overflowing with your presence and we can be about your business wherever we go, anointed of you, called by you, sent by you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Again, our ushers would love to serve you by picking up the cups. If you want to pass them to the aisles, that would be great. You could just sing, Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We worship you today. We ask that your presence would be thick in this place and that you would speak to your servants. Talk to us all, Lord, so that by the time we leave here, we will know that we have been, uh, that we've encountered the Most High. We love you today. We give you all the thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.
this time, I'd like to invite you to say hello to your neighbors. Who is your neighbor? The, p the person that's in your path, <laughs> which is everybody in here. So <laughs> feel free to move around and say hello for a few minutes. Our kids can be dismissed to King's Kids at this time. And little angels. All right, praise God. Once again, good morning to all of you. Thanks for being here. If you're new with us and you didn't catch the name of the church, it's Valley Christian Church. It's right up here. I have a few announcements before we receive our offering today and prayer requests too. Friendly church. I like that. 
We'll have more time to talk. Uh, as soon as we're done, we'll have some treats for you, I think, and uh, some coffee. But I um, want to make you aware of a, a few things. First of all, thank you for those of you that helped with the, uh, the ongoing rebuilding efforts in the islands called Vanuatu. Uh, we found out that there are many, many of these islands that were reached by Assemblies of God missionaries. And so as a result, there's thousands and thousands of uh, Christians, and in particular, Assemblies of God Christians that are in these islands. There's like 60 islands uh, close to Australia, as I understand it. About 45 of them have Assembly of God churches on them. When the hurricane blew through there, um, there was uh, so much devastation. And uh, the Assemblies of God has, has determined that they want to rebuild these churches. And so that's an ongoing effort. So thank you for those of you that have been giving uh, towards that at different times. We've been making sure that money gets to them and uh, things are taking place. What they're asking us to pray for is that God will help to provide the materials to rebuild the churches that were destroyed and that these churches will be witnesses in their communities as they minister God's grace and compassion. So we're going to pray for them in just a minute. Um, also, a, a second of three uh, prayer requests for today that we want to pray for as a church. We want to remember that um, uh, yesterday marked the one-year anniversary of the abduction of 219 schoolgirls in Nigeria. You remember that? By that Muslim group, uh, Boko Haram. And so it says that since assaults have begun by this radical uh, Islamist group, uh, an estimated 15,000 children have been killed and another 800,000 have been left homeless. So Nigeria is just absolutely racked by this and they aren't the only places that are, that are suffering because of these kinds of things. We wanna pray for them today. And then third, the third prayer request is, you, I'm sure you probably heard this, uh, it kind of hits somewhat close to home in that we have a church here, uh, Emmanuel International, that is a church made up primarily, uh, if not exclusively at this point, of people who come from Nepal. And so you heard that there was a terrible, devastating 7.8 earthquake that just hit, uh, I believe it was yesterday. Um, more than 1,400 deaths are already confirmed, but the figure really looks as though it's going to be rising. And so uh, I've got a couple pictures to show you. Uh, before all that prayer, though, I want to give you some good news, because sometimes in the midst of all the, the bad news, uh, we don't see that many good things. But we want to say, I know they're not here yet, but we still want to say welcome to uh, Micah Johnson. He is back in, he's here, and uh, this is a picture of him. And those of you who know that our, our friends Blake and Crystal uh, and their two girls have been in the process of working to adopt uh, a child, in this case, all the way from Ukraine. And this is a very, very difficult process. But you as a church stepped uh, up and you helped them financially and you've helped them especially, like Crystal was saying, with just your real um, affirmations. You, you let them know that you're praying for them, that you love them, and that you feel as though Mike is already a part of this church family. It wasn't that long ago, but it was months ago. I remember that right down here where we have our prayer time, sitting in a circle, we were saying, Lord, please bring that little boy back and, and already bind his heart to uh, what is going to be his new family, his new mom and his new dad. And that's exactly what's happened. And the doors have just opened in so many miraculous and wonderful ways, and they are back in town. Now, they're probably exhausted because it was just Friday night that they came back and the girls were sick and all those kind of things. But we wanted to let you know what was going on. Here's some good news, how the Lord has answered your prayer and how you as a church work together to change the life of one little person. Who knows what God is going to do through this young man? Amen? Who knows that he'll have a testimony someday where he'll say, I, I was someplace, I didn't have a mom, I didn't have a dad, I was in a, in a destitute place. But from around the world, because of God's providence, a Christian family reached out to me and received me as their own. What a great testimony. It's like our testimony, isn't it? Because we were lost without anyone to call us our own. Uh, the devil was our wicked stepfather, so to speak, and and the Lord came and he rescued us and he put us in his own home, his own family. We're sons and daughters now. Isn't that good? So that's good news. So this is Michael. When you get to see him probably next Sunday, or who knows, maybe they'll even come towards the end of the service. Make sure you're welcome. Because this is a new part of our congregation. Amen. I wanted to show you a couple of pictures, though. We want to pray for Nepal. Here's just some of the devastation, as you can see. It's very widespread. Uh, 
terrible, especially in uh, countries. I'm told this was 22 times stronger than the earthquake that hit Haiti. And so it's a, and you know how devastating that was. In many of these countries, uh, the, the buildings are not built the same way they're built here. So they crumble a lot easier, and it's just, it's just one problem after the other. So we want to pray for them, and we're going to pray for these other two needs. So will you, once more, would you stand with me? Because we, the Bible talks about when we stand praying. Jesus said that. Let's pray and stand for them right now, all right? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as your church, we come to you today, and we lift these three requests to you. They are too big for man, but they're not impossible to you, because nothing is impossible with the Lord that we serve. So we call to you on behalf, first of all, of all of our brothers and sisters in the islands of Vanuatu, and we ask you, Lord, to do miracles there. Thank you, Lord, for so many of the needs that have already been met by the generous uh, giving of many people, of your people around the world. But Father, we pray that there would continue to be an outpouring of support and that all the money that's needed be able to rebuild every church that has been damaged. We pray it would be built seven times better than it was before. We pray that everything the devil has meant to destroy would actually backfire on him. And we pray in the name of Jesus that all these churches will be able to serve more people and do more ministry and more people will get saved. We pray for the indigenous people there who do not know Christ as Savior, that they will see the, outs the swelling outpouring of support that comes in from all over the world They'll say, I want to be a part of a Christian family. I want to be a part of the church. And they'll give their hearts to you. So we pray for this, first of all. Secondly, Lord God, we lift those in Nigeria that suffered unspeakable horror. We pray, Father, that you would minister to them, these Christian families who have been deprived of their daughters and their mothers, their sisters. We pray, Lord, that your comfort would come upon them, that you would wrap your arms of love around them. We pray, Lord God, that you would minister to them. They need to know that you love them and that you're still for them when they're in their darkest hour. We pray they would feel your loving hand around them. We ask, Lord, especially for these ladies who have been, uh, who have been kidnapped and who knows what is going on in their lives. We can only imagine the horror they're experiencing. But we pray that they would feel your presence even in the midst of being in captivity and that you would reach in. You are the one who breaks burdens and you're the one who, who uh, uh, destroys prison cells and you, you bring the prisoner out and the captive you set free. So we ask, Lord God, that something would happen in the next couple days that, that they would be set free, that you would send liberators to liberate them from their bondage and you would bring them out in the name of Jesus and that they would have the testimony that you came and you saved them. Oh, Father, we pray, let your grace fall on Nigeria. We pray, Lord, for these murderous mobs that you would meet them as you did Saul of Tarsus and that you would call them to repentance in Jesus' mighty name. And then, Father, we lift up Nepal to you. God, you know the devastation that is there and that's continued to happen. Father, we pray right now that you would minister to every family, that you would cause your church to arise at this time. We pray, Father, that the church would, would come in there. Thank for Samaritan's Purse. Thank you for Convoy of Hope. Thank you for great organizations that will move into these terrible areas, these areas that have been racked with, with ruin and pain, and they will stretch forth the hands of Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, that all these needs will be met, that many, many people would rush into this situation who are skilled to be able to remove rubble and to um, and even save people who are trapped right now under the rubble, God. We pray for miracle after miracle of you saving people who who the world says it's impossible for them to save. But Father, with you, all things are possible. Send your angels to go to Nepal. God, we thank you. Your word uh, says that you are near to those of, who are of a broken and contrite heart. And now as they have broken hearts, God, come and show your nearness to them. We pray, Father, for healing and health and wholeness. And we pray, Lord, that Nepal would be built, built again. But we ask this time, Lord God, not with all of its idols and not with all of the things that, that represent uh, rebellion against you, but instead, Lord, we pray that they will bend the knee to Jesus and that as Christians come and, and serve them and help them and love them and bandage their wounds, that they will see the love of Jesus and they will turn to the gospel. We pray, Lord, it would happen over and over. God, we pray for our Nepali brothers and sisters who are right here in Grand Forks and Fargo, who have relatives back there that may have already died. Lord, we pray that you would comfort them today. Help us, Lord, when we see them come in for their service 
to show them love, the love of Jesus, to say, Jema see, and to embrace them, to say, we love you, we're thinking about your country, and we're praying for you today. Lord, help us to be your family, your loving arms around them as well. So Father, we lift these needs. They are great, but nothing's too difficult for you. And we pray, Lord, for significant change, for healing, for help to be on its way, for good things to take place today. Your church calls out to you now in the name of Jesus, and we give you thanks. Amen. Amen. All right, you can be seated today. Thank you for praying with me. We want to always remember to pray. Sometimes this is one of the worst uh, uh, habits of us as Christians is someone tells us about a need and we'll say, I'll be praying for you, and then we forget. I've done it so many times myself. And so especially when we're in the church, it's time to pray right away. I'd like to invite our ushers forward because we're going to receive our offering. I want to remind you that um, every gift counts. I've heard of some people who said, I only had a few cents in my pocket, so I thought that would be an insult to the Lord, so I decided not to give it. I'm saying it's not an insult. Um, just give to the Lord as you're able, and, and he uh, sees equal sacrifice rather than equal giving. Amen? So I just urge you to, to do what you know is right, to give to the Lord, and God will meet the needs of this house. Also, I would say this too, that if you're wanting to give towards um, something to help Nepal, I am sure that our uh, ministries, Assemblies of God Ministries, will be in there real quick, and they're going to be giving us updates, and they're going to need finances to be able to help with this. So if that's even something that you want to do now, just make sure on your offering envelope it says Nepal for whatever amount you want to give. We'll put that money away, and I'm sure they'll be sending us probably a fax today about what we should do and how we should redirect those monies. So, and if not, just make sure that next week when you come, you're ready to be able to give something to help with this need. Father, we thank you that we can give to you. We give so now in faith and uh, thanksgiving. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thanks for generous giving. I really appreciate it. Is this thing cutting out? I think it is. Can you hear it back there a lot or no? Do I, if I stand, it's, it's like the Bermuda Triangle, you know, you go one place and then it works and one place it doesn't work, but if it gets too annoying, you just wave at me, uh, Lo, uh, Lucas, and I will pull this one out here. So today, I'd like to um, talk to you as we are continuing to go through the Gospel of John. Uh, I'm just kind of using a, a phrase that's been used many times, but it's a really, really uh, important um, truth-filled statement, and that is that we as Christians should seek the Lord's face and not just his hand. Does that make a sense? If you don't understand what that means, you'll understand as we go through the message, to seek his face and not just his hands. His hands represent what he can do for us, which is awesome. It's amazing. Nothing wrong with that at all, to seek his hands, to seek God's uh, provision in our life. He, he wants us to ask him for things. But there's something higher, uh, not necessarily to the exclusion of the other, but to seek his face, to, to want to hear his words, and to want to, to know him as a person. And this is relationship, as opposed to just, God, I need something, and then, and then I gotta go, <laughs> right? I'll just use this one. Is it, we're not sure That's okay, I got two hands. I can do this one and this hand and this, we're good. All right. So what is this sermon all about? This sermon is all about good news, the good news that is in all of the Gospels, but especially the Gospel of John. And it's just this, that God loves you and me enough to want an eternally committed, loving relationship with us. That's an awesome thought, isn't it? He actually wants relationship with us. So that's what this message is about. And if you feel convicted during this, that's a good thing. But if you feel any guilt, then that's not of God. That's not the intention of this message at all. This is a message to lift you up, to help you uh, engage in relationship with God in a way maybe you haven't up to this point, and to let you know how much he loves you and how much he wants to draw you closer into his heart. So today we're going to do something different. Usually I put the uh, scriptures up here and then you kind of follow along. Sometimes you read them. 
I'd like to do something different today. I want to invite you, as I read the scripture today, to close your eyes. And if this doesn't bother you, you don't get vertigo or something like that, if you're willing to just kind of close your eyes, not fall asleep, but um, of course I wouldn't know unless you start snoring, then I'll know. But <laughs> I want to invite you to close your eyes and listen to this lengthy scripture passage. It's probably going to take me about three minutes to read the entire passage. But I want you to be listening as though you were the ones who were, received the, the, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Let's say that you're part of that group. You tasted the best bread you'd ever tasted in your life and the best fish, and it was provided for you by Jesus. And then you decided you needed to go and, and you wanted to seek this Jesus, but you're really coming after him because you just wanted what he could provide. You wanted that bread. It was so good. Uh, you, you couldn't forget the taste of it. You wanted to get together with him so that maybe he could make lunch again for you, right? And, and I want you to think about maybe being a part of that crowd as I read this and sometimes closing your eyes. Maybe you can even imagine what it looked like there, how you had to go around the lake and just let the words that are uh, in order to find Jesus, let the words of the scripture kind of fill in the blanks and, and, and create the scene in your mind. The Bible talks about meditating on the word of God. So that means to really think about it. And, and so uh, close your eyes if you're, if you're willing to do that and just hear this. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, he walked on the water. That's the piece that you didn't know, but just think about this, okay? So he's already on the other side of the lake here. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them. That's us he's answering now. And listen with that in mind. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, be but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? They're hoping he would make bread again. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. But then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should not lose anything, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Then the Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. 
It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to quarrel among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it had been granted to him by my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, did I, not, did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Okay, you can open your eyes again. It's good to listen to Scripture more than just ten seconds of it, isn't it? Just to hear it. And I think already of you, some of you have already heard some things that maybe you, were, you hadn't heard before and kind of interested in. Now, let's unpack this because there's so much there, we're just going to talk about really one thing today. Remember, our sermon is seeking his face and not just his hands. Fundamentally, that seemed to be the problem, didn't it? Let's just sum up. What, what, what are we, in all of that scripture that I just read, what, what, what can we grab a hold of? First of all, the people needed a miracle. That, that we're, we're backtracking now to last Sunday, right? They needed a miracle. They were hungry. They didn't have food. There were thousands of them out there to listen to Jesus, but they were in a quandary because they didn't have any food, and it would have been really difficult for them to go find food anywhere. And so the disciples of Jesus say to him, they need food. We've got, we need a miracle, right? And guess what happened? Jesus provided an amazing miracle. This miracle of feeding the 5,000, really probably about 25,000, was so incredible that all four gospel writers included it. Most other miracles, excluding the resurrection, are not necessarily in all four of the Gospels. This is one that's in all four of the Gospels. Why? Because it was so absolutely incredible to them. It was an amazing miracle. It supplied their need. The people rejoiced and they began to follow Jesus. So can you imagine church growth, right? One miracle like this. You've got 12 guys, maybe a few other people following you, but then all of a sudden there's thousands that are there. You do this miracle, and not only do those thousands that tasted this bread and ate this fish begin to follow you, but all their friends and their relatives, they say, we found the Messiah. Come with us. And he makes really good bread. He might make free lunch for us again. Let's go find him. Let's get in our boats. Let's run around the side of the, on the shoreline. Let's see if we can find him. Because if he can do that for 15, 20,000 people at a shot, he could do that every day. 
I mean, after all, that's the way it was with Moses, right? Every day was bread was there, except for when the preparation for the Sabbath, and there was two days worth, so they didn't work on the Sabbath day. But I mean, every day bread came down. So they're thinking, this is going to happen again. This is awesome. We don't have to scrounge and sweat to try to make enough money to, uh, and, to, and to plant and to, to sow and to, to reap and, and, and to be able to make enough to have food for our own families. No, the Messiah is here, and guess what he does? He makes food every day, served right up. His disciples will even bring it to you. You could just sit down on the grass. They'll come and bring it to you. How wonderful, right? So this is in their mind probably, right? But Jesus pointed out that they were merely seeking what he could do for them and not really seeking him. In other words, they were seeking his hands and not necessarily his face or his heart. Does that make sense to everybody? We're tracking so far? This is the point that many stopped following Jesus and looked elsewhere for their needs to be satisfied. Did you, see, did you hear that when I was reading the scripture? It said a whole bunch of them left. How sad is that, right? You have this big revival, this great miracle. Thousands of people are following Jesus. They're praising him. They're thanking him. And then he points out that what they're really after is what he could provide and not really after him. They're, they're looking for the bread he could provide, but they're not realizing he's actually the bread. He's the one that wants to feed them. If they have him, they'll have the bread. But if they're just looking for the bread, they won't necessarily just have Jesus. You understand? You got to have the Lord. And, and, they, and this is where they stopped. So the same thing happens to us today when, number one, Jesus seems to pull away from us. It's easy for us to kind of start wondering, right? Or number two, when Jesus seems to fail to repeat past miracles. Notice he wasn't willing to do it again. He didn't just say, okay, you know, and then make a, another 1,000 loaves for them or 15,000 loaves. He, he used that as a, a point to be able to, to speak truth to them because they were off track, Sure, they were willing to be around Jesus, but obviously, like he said, you're laboring for the food that will perish. You're not here because of me. And he said, really, the work that I want you to do is just, you got to believe in me. Put your full trust in me. Have a relationship with me. I'm the bread. This was all an illustrated sermon, essentially, is what he's saying, for me to give bread to more than enough, because there were 12 baskets left over, Right? So it was thousands and thousands of loaves that Jesus made that came miraculously from heaven. What was the object lesson here? There's more than enough. If you come to Jesus, there's more than enough to feed you. Right? Amen? The other thing that happens to us when we start to fall away is when Jesus calls us to marriage rather than dating or using him for what we want. That's just kind of, you know, the Bible uses this marital sort of language, so I can use that too. There is a difference, isn't there, between dating and marriage? Amen? Dating, there's always this escape potential. There's always this possibility that might, you s might say it's not working out. But if you're really married in a covenant and you say, we are in this to win this. We're in this for good. All the chips have been pushed into the center. We are married, and that's all there is to it. If you're, if you're that way, you don't have the same kind of possibilities as when you were just dating. It's the same way with the Lord. When you really say, I am yours, Jesus, for better or for worse, something changes in your relationship with him. And when he calls us to that, for whatever reason, a lot of us slink away. Or we, we I mean, like a lot of us guys, we, we're afraid of commitment, right? Uh, and, and so sometimes uh, guys who are dating, they're afraid of that commitment, afraid of taking that next step and saying, you know, I love, I, I love you and you exclusively, and I want to be married to you. Well, at some point, you know, Jesus calls us to that kind of relationship too. He wants us to be exclusive and not to, and not to look for other, in other places to satisfy our needs. So when this happens, it reveals the motives of our heart clearly and sometimes painfully, but it's a good and necessary thing. All of us go through this in our Christian life. It's really hard. It's difficult. But it kind of reveals, do we really want Jesus 